had tracked through the book of Romans. We have now reached chapter 9, that great chapter on God's uh, absolute sovereignty. And uh, we will be looking at this full chapter today. I, I know it would be nice if we could break it up, but I think because of uh, the information here that it begs us to, uh, to try to place it all together here. So bear with me this morning. That's why we only sing two songs instead of uh, three as we normally do to try to uh, have a little bit more time. This is a lot of material, but I think to be able to get it in proper context, we need to get all of it here. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 9 of Romans, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience is testifying to me with the Holy Spirit that I have intense sorrow and continual anguish in my heart for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off uh, from the Messiah for the benefit of my brothers, my countrymen, my physical descent. They are Israelites and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service and the promises, the Forefathers are theirs, and from them, by physical descent, came the Messiah, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, neither are they all children, because they are Abraham's descendants. On the contrary, in Isaac, your seed will be called. That is, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but the children of the promise are considered seed. For this is the statement of the promise, at this time I will come, and Sarah will have a son. And not only that, but also when Rebecca became pregnant by Isaac, our forefather, for though, for though they had not been born yet or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to election, might stand not for works, but for the one who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I have shown mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture tells Pharaoh, for this reason I raised you up, so that I might display my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he shows mercy to whom he wills, and he pardons whom he wills. You will say to me, therefore, why then does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, anyone who talks back to God? Will what is formed say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Or has the potter no right over his clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? And what if God, desiring to display his wrath, and to make his, uh, his power known, endured with much patience, objects of wrath, ready for destruction. And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory, on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory, on us whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As he also says in Hosea, I will, not, I will call not my people, my people, and she who is unloved, beloved. And it will be in the place where they were told, you are not my people. There they will be called sons of the living God. But Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of Israel's sons is like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will execute his sentence completely and decisively on the earth. And just as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. What should we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes from faith. But Israel pursuing the law for righteousness has not achieved the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Look, I am putting a stone in Zion to stumble over, and a rock to trip over. Yet the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, this is a lot. This is a lot to digest. But God, we ask that you speak to each person according to the language of what they hear, what they need to know. 
I pray for your Holy Spirit that it moves among us and it speaks to us that we hear you and you alone, Lord. Let this be your word, not my words, always your word. Lord, please speak through me, inspire me, and to me, anoint me for this task that I'm not capable of. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Paul, at last, has come to the end of this first major portion of his epistle here in the book of Romans. He's discussed the principles of the gospel, drawing together the various threads that make up the tapestry uh, picture of man's sin, of salvation and sanctification. Now in the next three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, the Apostle Paul discusses the problem of the gospel or the difficulty of the gospel, particularly as these difficulties relate to the Jewish people. Now God has made uh, many great and wonderful promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses, to David, to Solomon. And many of these promises focused in on the person of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was murdered by the Jews at Calvary. Now in His great merciful love, God gave the nation of Israel a second chance, an opportunity to reverse its terrible, its terrible verdict, and by repentance and faith to accept Christ Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. Now the book of Acts, in the history of which Paul himself prayed, plays a prominent role, records the second chance. The Jews, however, were stubborn and hard-hearted. Uh, the Jews rejected Christ once again as they had the first time. And when the apostle wrote the letter to the Romans, the temple was still standing in Jerusalem. The sacrifices were still being offered and the elaborate ritual of Judaism, now meaningless, was still being continued. Paul knew that Christianity was the death knell of Judaism. Even before Paul's conversion to Christ, he knew the two systems could not coexist. Hence, his bitter hatred of Christianity, Christianity in those days and his zeal to stamp it out. But once Paul or Saul was changed to Paul, a mature believer, the very uh, apostle to the Gentiles, he knew he must come to grips with the difficulties of the gospel as they relate to the Jew. Now what about these ancient promises? Were they canceled now? And where does the Jew fit in? Paul had to answer these questions to the Jews and to all of those who would read or hear this, his preaching. Now in these chapters, Paul looks first to the past, then to the present, and finally he will look to the future. The apostle displays to the reader in each successive chapter that the key to all of God's past dealings with Israel is the sovereignty of God. And the key to all of God's present dealings with Israel is the salvation of God. And the key to all of God's promised dealings with Israel